The Final Fantasy series is big. It's big, and it's long. Can, can I have a new sentence? Thank you. Final Fantasy is one of the pillars of gaming's pantheon, an indefatigable series historically, culturally, and artistically. It's a mess of a behemoth of a franchise, composed of 16 independent mainline entries, with each of those individual games having re-releases and graphical overhauls across many generations and platforms. Sequels, sequels to sequels, remakes and redux versions, and that's on top of movies and spin-offs. In a word, formidable. Because of its significance, I had a deep yearning, somewhere between desire and obligation, to sit down and play through all the mainline Final Fantasy games. So I did. Through the powers of a career-crippling video game addiction sparked, somehow, by Final Fantasy III, I played through the entire series from June 2023 to December 2023. This seven-month gauntlet has ended here, with a novel-length, 53,000-word analysis of the entire Final Fantasy series, covering each entry from the humble Final Fantasy 1 all the way to the AAA Final Fantasy 16. What I observed while playing through the series is that Final Fantasy's unending influence on the gaming landscape helps to obscure its great artistry. From its debut in 1987, the Final Fantasy series, created by Hironobu Sakaguchi, has grown and changed from a popular series of Japanese RPGs to the driving force of global console RPGs and ultimately into one of gaming's most permanent institutions. The success of Final Fantasy helped turn Square, its developer and publisher, into a juggernaut capable of indulging numerous passion projects, corporate takeovers, anti-consumer shakedowns, Sisyphean technological advancements, and somehow losing fathoms of money, bucket after bucket of money, while also making more than just about any other entertainment business on the planet. The modern gaming landscape, from the companies that control it to our understanding of the RPG genre and the culture itself, cannot be disentangled from Final Fantasy. But I will try, mostly by leaving the historical half of Final Fantasy to other videos and other writers. Instead, we are going to look at these games as breathing works of art nestled in the riverbeds of wider artistic tradition. My goal is to place each game into a wider context, into emotional, philosophical, and artistic conversations that exist independent of time and medium, and hopefully bring a new appreciation to all of these games. Because that's the weirdest part of the Final Fantasy series to me. Every single game in this series is awesome. Even the supposed bad games, the ones people are barking about at their screen right now, are great. And it's my hope that this analysis will bring new appreciation even to the most long-suffering of Final Fantasy titles. Before we jump in, a little housekeeping. I didn't know I would be making this video when I started playing the games, so I recorded very little footage. With the exception of Final Fantasy V, everything you see in these videos will be from various long plays and gameplay videos on YouTube. Links to all sources used are in the description. Besides, I played most of these games portably in the hot tub on my video game essayist yacht. I don't keep my Elgato capture card there. But with that, let's set out on our journey. Here's our timeline, with all 16 games. Why are they a circle, a 16-piece pizza, instead of a linear left-to-right timeline, you may ask? It'll make more sense at the end. But for now, that's enough introduction. Without further ado, let's get into the wonderful and wide-ranging world that is Final Fantasy. The first question everyone asks is, which version of Final Fantasy did you play? Before giving their takes on each of the numerous releases. For this video, I played the Pixel Remaster, an answer that will satisfy nobody, although I have ancient experience with Dawn of Souls and the NES version. I point this out at the start because every release of Final Fantasy carries a certain historical and critical anxiety. For those like me who enjoy seeing games at their purest, 
Final Fantasy is a challenge, with every version changing and tweaking the original version, or if it is the original version, being outright broken to a point where its gameplay systems don't work anywhere near their intended function. Changes like expanded inventory or how MP works alter the experience, and this can make it difficult to judge Final Fantasy on its own terms because its terms vary between every version, so in this video I'll primarily be focused on the elements common between all of the versions. For a game that has spawned the second most popular JRPG series in the world, Final Fantasy is something of an anomaly within its own series. What everyone who plays this game sees at the outset of their adventure is a class selection screen. With six classes and a total of 126 different possible party compositions, this choice, right at the beginning of the game, is the most substantial decision the player will make for the entirety of Final Fantasy. All of the meaningful customization is front-loaded. This puts Final Fantasy more in line with its tabletop counterparts and the earlier American RPGs Wizardry and Ultima. The name Ultima will come to bear a greater significance to the series, especially when we reach its end with 16, but for this brief moment in time, it's Ultima's influence on the class selection that defines Final Fantasy. Before the player knows what challenges they will face, what monsters stalk the forests and lurk in the waters, they are asked to form a complete party. It's an important and permanent decision that has to be made based on essentially no in-game information. Attentive players who read their manuals would have more information. The glorious 89-page NES manual includes a description of each class and, importantly, has six recommended party compositions with teams ranging from all-out offensive blitzes to magic palooza and everything in between. It's easy to get decision paralysis from a screen like this, especially when it's this contextless and permanent. However, this decision is not meant to be a trick. The importance of the suggestions in the manual isn't that Fighter, Black Belt, White Mage, and Black Mage is the best party combination, but that any combination of classes can beat the game. The obviously foolish decisions, like a party of four White Mages, are not likely to be made by players, and even then, those parties can beat the game with some elbow grease. The class selection, coupled with its low stakes, lays the groundwork that will run through later games like 2, 6, and 12 where it's much harder to make a bad choice than it is to make a good choice. The Final Fantasy games are generally pretty easy, occasional boss roadblocks aside, and the first game is no exception. The low difficulty makes a player-driven decision like party composition exciting because rather than modulating difficulty on an unseen scale, it creates unique experiences for players. Some teams will have harder and easier sections, but the cumulative resistance is similar for most parties. This structure, where large customization at the start of the game funnels each player down different linear experiences, is the coolest part of Final Fantasy, and it makes the game eminently replayable. Later games with similar class systems like 3, 5, and 12's Zodiac Age Edition can, in a sense, be replayed during a single playthrough since class change or resetting builds is free and encouraged. Having a unique experience from both other players and oneself during each playthrough is Final Fantasy's greatest asset, even on a narrative level. Before the player even knows what the narrative is, they are dropped into the open world and left to walk into town and into the nearby castle where the plot gets underway. Throughout this video, I will speak very rarely on music. It's sacrosanct to not talk much about Final Fantasy's music, sure, but I also don't know how many times I can say, it's great. We already know that. But it would be horrible to give no space to Nobuo Uematsu and what his music did for the series. My earliest memory of playing Final Fantasy is the theme for Castle Cornelia. Of all the music in the series, Castle Cornelia taps the strongest emotional wellspring inside of me. Like many people, my first experience with Final Fantasy was the American NES release of the original game, but unlike many other people who can say that, I was born in 1996, at the tail end of the millennial generation. 
For some, this makes me a by the books, no doubt about it, Zoomer, and I've had this argument plenty of times, especially during my fake career as a streamer. It's a silly distinction, but I've always had a stronger connection to millennials than Zoomers because the technology I grew up with was defiant holdovers from the 80s and 90s. Growing up in Kentucky creates a strained relationship with time. Mark Twain famously didn't actually say that I want to be in Kentucky at the end of the world because everything happens 20 years late there. This falsified quotation has had cultural staying power because it really does feel true. Technology in my youth was static. Dial-up internet and a computer desk littered with stolen AOL trial disks are as distinct to me as the concurrent launch of the Wii and PlayStation 3. Compared to the old Super Nintendo and NES that rotated through composite hookups on the basement CRT, my cousin's Nintendo 64 seemed downright futuristic. When the illuminated neon case of new PlayStation 2 games flashed at passersby at a moribund 2003 Funko Land, soon to be changed from the earnest rainbow colors to the mature and lifeless red and white of GameStop, I stood with my dad, digging out hastily organized NES and SNES games from a wireframe cart. Super Mario Kart, Castlevania, and, of course, Final Fantasy came from these scroungings. Every console generation was adopted about five years late in my house. The first time I would have a home console near its launch was the PlayStation 4. When I moved into a dorm in 2016, my second year of college, I hooked up a PlayStation 3, and when I moved out in 2017, I unhooked a PlayStation 4. The PS4 released on my birthday in 2013, so I celebrated by spoiling myself with one on my birthday in 2016. The gap between Kentucky and the rest of the world was closing. Two weeks after I bought a PlayStation 4, Final Fantasy XV released. But until that moment, in November 2016, Final Fantasy was not a series of the present, but of the past and future. When I finally sat down to play that Funko Land NES copy of Final Fantasy for myself in 2009, it was around the time Final Fantasy XIII was released for the Xbox 360. The richest person I knew owned an original Xbox. So while I dreamed of the HDMI images of Final Fantasy XIII that I'd maybe see for myself one day, I plunged into the composite memories of NES Final Fantasy. Of course, I couldn't beat the game, I didn't have the illustrious manual, and even at 13 years old, I didn't have the RPG experience. But I do have memories, and the earliest one from this series, appropriately enough, are its Sonic Origins. For the game itself, Castle Cornelia matters because it's where the plot begins. Being an NES RPG, the narrative is threadbare, and the lack of main characters doesn't help that initial impression. However, the Heroes of Light, as the game refers to the party, being so fungible, yet so static, adds great resonance to the game as the credits roll, even if the journey seems anonymous. It is true to say that the story is minimal compared to what would follow, but much like how the simple story of Dragon Quest establishes that series' simple, classical fantasy stories, Final Fantasy establishes the series' penchant for late-game twists and reality-bending narratives. It's important not to mistake this for convolution. Final Fantasy narrative extravagance is often called convoluted. The endings of later games like 7, 8, 10, and 13 are sometimes called convoluted, and their genesis can be found in the original game's time-looped finale, but the criticism that the series has convoluted narratives often refuses to engage with those narratives. As we go through the series, one thing I'll almost never say is that these games are complex for complexity's sake. The more complex plots in the series sometimes have story beats that are difficult to parse, but they are always carefully considered and thematically resonant. This is true even of the first game, despite it being technologically limited in both text and scope. The setup is simple. The four elemental fiends put out the lights of the four elemental crystals, causing the world to rot. But matters are not as simple as they may seem when it comes to restoring the light, led along by the player through dungeons and towns, across the seas and skies. The Heroes of Light come to discover that the Fiends, protecting their destruction of the world, have sent Garland, the knight who kidnapped the Princess of Cornelia and the first foe the heroes slayed, back in time to become Chaos Incarnate, crafting a time loop where Chaos sends the Fiends into the future so that the Fiends can send Garland into the past and so on into infinity. It's unknown just how many different Heroes of Light, how many of the 126 possible bands, have traveled into the past to kill chaos, only to fail. Maybe we're the first, maybe we're the tenth, 
or the thousandth, but by killing chaos, by saving the world, our heroes remain nameless, forgotten slates known only in faded legend. Each possibility for the player's party is a different way this could have gone, and every name they pick for those nameless heroes is only another possibility for how this forgotten tale played out. That the narrative of Final Fantasy and many of its sequels can be confusing in a plot summary doesn't get to the heart of these games. As the worlds in games like 8, 13, and 15 become more complex and impenetrable, the journey of the characters becomes more inward. 8 and 13 will couch complex, rich protagonists in nonsense worlds of jargon and complex politics, but the trend is set here, with a time loop that itches and scratches at your brain and acts as a home for Garland's thirst for power and fear of death, and as a platform for the noble sacrifice by the heroes of light. It's easy to be Achilles when you know your heroic death will carry with it the glory and honor of eternity, but it's difficult to be a hero when no one will know your name. The Heroes of Light have made the opposite choice of Achilles. They can choose to journey forth or not. They can succeed or fail. But no matter what they choose, and no matter how they do, they will be forgotten. This is a riff on Achilles' story, who, in the Iliad, chooses the honor of early death on the battlefield over the obscurity of domestic peace. Entering the Heroes of Light into this ancient struggle between death, glory, and legacy makes it stand apart from the later Final Fantasy games. Characters in the ancient Greek epics and tragedies are often driven by ideals, by their principled failings. Oedipus's dedication to the truth and Achilles' quest for honor are principled stances that drive their actions. The Heroes of Light, like the Greek legends, are different from future Final Fantasy protagonists because their character is defined by their interaction with the world, rather than their inner monologue. Most future Final Fantasy protagonists will instead follow the character arcs established by Shakespeare and the Romantics, where their growth and change is primarily caused by the character's inner struggles. Final Fantasy will be a series defined by inward quests, but it's not there yet in the first game. Unlike other RPGs with silent protagonists, Persona, Chrono Trigger, Earthbound, there's not a single party member in Final Fantasy that speaks. The Heroes of Light are entirely without inner lives, and operate almost as a single character like a Greek chorus. And so the only character we get is based on how they interact with the world. Who they are and what their motivations are can only be inferred, and like any silent protagonist, there's a healthy dose of vicarious reading that goes into interpreting them. To me, the willingness to be forgotten by the Heroes of Light, no matter the outcome, implies that they, like the legendary heroes, are driven by ideals. A constant in this series will be heroes and villains serving as dramatic foils. Using that knowledge, we can infer who the Heroes of Light are by looking at Garland. Garland wants power and eternal life. The Heroes of Light, therefore, want peace and anonymity. Future Final Fantasy protagonists will desire to be heard, even if only by themselves, and the Heroes of Light don't even need that. On a pure, fantastical level, they are the most heroic of the Final Fantasy heroes. The lack of any character, any personality, that is with the player the whole game creates a unique structure. Every definable character makes sporadic or one-off appearances from Garland to Princess Sarah and Bahamut to the Dwarven Smith. Even though Final Fantasy has a narrative that ties together the beginning and ending before wrapping back around itself several infinite times, most of the game is episodic, progressing from short story to short story. In the journey to restore the four elemental crystals, the player adventures to many unique locations. Lava lands and frozen tundras and, my personal favorite, the underwater city that you have to ride a barrel sub to access. But then there's my second favorite, favorite location. The final major location the player visits in Final Fantasy before the end game, the Flying Fortress, a cyber city in the sky, housing the ruins of lost technology and mechanical marvels. This location is lifted from Jonathan Swift's novel, Gulliver's Travels, a book that serves as a cool little influence on Final Fantasy and the JRPG more broadly. Gulliver's Travels is what's known as a travelogue novel, a genre of book where outrageous authors wrote about their outlandish travels to audiences of 1700s normies who never would have seen any of the world beyond their small hamlets and Wainwright shops, and many times these authors lied extensively about their travels, even though these books were marketed as the real stories of real adventurers. Gulliver's Travels is the supreme satire of the genre, presented as a real, awesome, grand tale, but is in reality 
a sequence of unskippable cutscenes and side quests for Lemuel Gulliver, first a surgeon, and then a captain of several ships. An overarching narrative replaced by a series of small vignettes lay the groundwork for the side quest and general narrative structure of JRPGs, especially in the days before quest markers and hunts. A common criticism against many JRPGs, including Final Fantasy, is that the narratives are often poorly paced, with isolated stories and side quests that mosey along against the more pressing main plot. But I see this criticism not as a problem, but as one of the strengths of JRPGs as a form. It's easy to imagine Lemuel Gulliver getting caught up in a blitzball tournament, horse betting at the Golden Saucer, or digging for treasure in Chocobo Hot and Cold. It takes advantage of a unique quality of games, which is that they can have expansive, optional content that takes place over small periods of in-world time. The gaming industry has spent decades trying to be more like movies, when what they need to embrace is 1700s travelogue novels. Whether or not Hironobu Sakaguchi has read Gulliver's Travels is immaterial, because this observation stemmed from the Flying Fortress, a location whose concept is lifted directly from the flying city of Laputa in Gulliver's Travels Part 3, a voyage to Laputa, Balnabarbi, Lugnag, Glubdubdrib, and Japan. For Japanese audiences in the 80s, and modern anime and video game fans, the flying city of Laputa is most recognized as the Castle in the Sky in Hayao Miyazaki's film Laputa Castle in the Sky, released one year before Final Fantasy. In Final Fantasy, there is only one major side quest, the Bahamut quest, that lets the party promote into advanced classes. For most new players, this side quest is more or less mandatory because it helps the meta-knowledge-starved player keep up with the power curve. However, it's still a reprieve from the main action into a Swiftian side quest. The player has to find Bahamut and then survive an optional dungeon to retrieve the legendary Rat Tail to prove their worth to Bahamut. This lays the groundwork for side quests in the first 10 Final Fantasy games. There's probably someone pulling their hair out as I yap about Gulliver's Travels because there's one other important influence for the series and the structure of short stories and side quests that form a collective whole, and that's the tabletop RPG. The first decade of video game RPGs was all about finding ways to transport tabletop systems into a new digital form, and Final Fantasy wears that influence both structurally and mechanically. For many modern players, this game's magic system is maddening. It uses the charge system from Dungeons & Dragons, or as I prefer to say, from Dark Souls, linear time be damned, and it's archaic. Or, well, archaic in the sense that few games use that system anymore. The charge system will come back in Final Fantasy III, but what's notable about it in the first game is that it's so restrictive. This is the one Final Fantasy game where I routinely stocked up on 99 potions because healing spells are so valuable that the strong ones need to be saved for battle. By the late game, I would routinely chew through dozens and dozens and dozens and then some more and then a dozen more potions and antidotes, in part because these old school dungeons feel like dungeons. I hated being in basically all of them, and I think that's why they're awesome in their own little way. You hear the word dungeon, and it's an awful word. It brings up images of torture and booby traps, and the dungeons in Final Fantasy deliver on that with poisonous monsters and lava floors, and it's just so classically charming. Because of its compacted simplicity, this is the one game in the series that truly has that classical feeling, even if later games like 3 and 5 share a similar tone and fancifulness. In a way, that's befitting a series with the name Final Fantasy. The beginning is also the end, because with Final Fantasy II, the series will dive with great fervor into the world of character-driven narratives and grand melodrama.
This game is so freaking crazy. Absolutely nuts. Final Fantasy II is now, through the fog of time, considered the worst game in the main series by many. I'm not going to help it beat the charges, but I think that reputation sells it short. People have spent decades hyperfixated on the bizarre mechanics and suboptimally exploiting those bizarre mechanics, and in doing so, we've lost sight of how wacky Final Fantasy II is and how important an experiment it is in the development of the series. For better and for worse, Final Fantasy II released exactly 365 days after the first game and established the series as one of constant tinkering and changes. This is in contrast to its main rival, Dragon Quest, which, by the release of Final Fantasy II, bore three games that stood proud of their mechanical and aesthetic stability, even as the games expanded in scope and size. Final Fantasy II, in prologue to VI's Esper's and VIII's Junction System and XII's License Board, decouples character growth from a strict linear relationship with level, instead correlating growth with player action. The way it works in two is that stats increase with their usage. Hitting enemies increases strength, getting your ass beat increases HP, using spells increases MP, and on top of that, every weapon like swords and bows in each spell like fire and cure has its own proficiency level for each character that is developed with repeated usage. Because of its obtuse implementation, it's a contentious change from the first game and is often the exclusive target of Final Fantasy II discussion. In later games, and also the one earlier game, spell levels exist with sequences like Fire, Fira, and Firaga, and weapon types are tied to mechanics like Jobs or the License Board. The key difference between Final Fantasy II and the systems that came later is that the later systems have greater clarity of feedback. When Fire goes from level 1 to 2, it's hard to tell exactly how much more powerful it is, especially when it's out of a possible 16 levels. Same for weapon levels, but those have even less clarity as their development will stall out for no obvious diegetic reason. Comparatively, learning new spells or gaining access to new weapons in Final Fantasy XII directly correlates with spending license points and requires a clear tactile action to be made. Final Fantasy II doesn't have that tactile clarity and it results in both a bunch of misinformation and player anxiety around how the game works. Without getting into the granular details, Final Fantasy II is more or less built to work naturally with the player moving at a brisk pace from story beat to story beat, using whatever weapons and armor and magic they so choose. In the first game, grinding was a part of the experience, but grinding, despite what is sometimes said, isn't required in two, and is actively disincentivized by the game's hidden systems that restrict player growth relative to enemy strength. For Final Fantasy II, the most important thing is for the player to keep moving. Along with the more involved story, this is the one game in the series to feature no side quests, no optional dungeons, no side stories. Despite the open design of the overworld, this game is a straight shot, a story fired out of a cannon, and the game's leveling mechanics are built to keep this relentless pace up. The DNA of this can be seen in the later linear games, 10 and 13, but even those games take time out for late game side quests and a leveling system that asks the player to fumble around in menus. This shift away from RPG level grinding and a reprieve from Gulliver's Travels core was the correct call for this game considering its narrative priorities. In Final Fantasy, we were dropped into the world, meant to explore our immediate surroundings, and are told by an NPC about the inciting incident. In 2, we are thrust into the inciting incident, an interactive cutscene that's a first for the series and will be expanded further in games like 7, 8, and 16. We get clobbered, of course, and in this massacre we are introduced to the first named playable characters in the series, Firion, Maria, Guy, and Leon. Here, the seeds of future archetypes and mechanics are sown. Sid makes his first appearance as the crotchety drunken airship captain. Leon is a conflicted dark knight who lays the groundwork for future characters like Kane and Celis. As well, we have a rotating roster of guest characters who help the party like in 12 and 16. Throughout most of the game, Leon is truant. His roster spot is frequently filled by these rotating support characters. These party guests are awesome because they give the player a more dynamic relationship with the story. 
Based on the current situation, party members will come and go, making each stretch of the game feel unique, and it also modulates the difficulty. Rather than the game being a steady, linear power creep like in the first game, the difficulty in 2 oscillates with the coming and going of party members. When Minwoo shows up, the game becomes a lot easier, and when he leaves the party, our backs are up against the wall. Even though the game doesn't become significantly harder, it psychologically puts the player in a tougher spot, and I love it for that. The idea of a rotating cast, swapping in and out of the party as the story twists and turns will be expanded on as the core gameplay feature of Final Fantasy IV, but here it's more limited and more tragic. Being a guest party member in 2 is all bad. Characters dying, especially minor playable characters, isn't rare in the series. It happens, but three of the poor bastards in 2 pass away violently. Playing 2 is a string of Minwoo, no! Joseph, no! Rickard, no! All of these deaths are operatic and noble. Classical drama. Joseph's death deserves a special mention because he gets fucking killed by Pat Patriot throwing a boulder at him. It's silly, it's grand, and when you let yourself go and groove with what the game's putting down, it's really satisfying. As a series, Final Fantasy loves big scenes of interpersonal drama and sacrifice, and the beginnings of that love are found here. Joseph, protecting the party from a giant boulder, sacrifices himself to protect the slim chance of saving the world. I haven't yet described any specifics of the story, but noble sacrifices in the face of evil are gloriously operatic, and the earnest drive that Final Fantasy has to tell grand, melodramatic stories will only become more effective over time as the characters grow more detailed and fleshed out. For now, everything is basic. A certain level of appreciation for 2 comes from its age and for what it accomplished on now rudimentary hardware. It's an effective story, continuously entertaining, but also simple, humbled in esteem by the passage of time. But don't let that take away from its formal strengths. Some of its construction is still as exciting now in the Pixel Remaster as it was on the Famicom in 88, with the town of Altair being the greatest of its accomplishments. When Fury and Maria and Guy are rescued after the opening battle that saw the evil Empire Palamecia destroy their hometown in the Kingdom of Finn, they wake up at a rebel base in Altair led by Princess Hilda. This has started a tradition of everyone pointing at Final Fantasy and shouting Star Wars, but more importantly, this opening establishes Altair as the hub that the game flows through. The overworld of Final Fantasy II is one of the most open in the series. Even though this is, to a degree, the most linear game in the series, most of the game world can be easily walked from the start. There's a unity to the world of Palamecia and Finn. Even if the game is paced the same as 10 and 13, its world can be felt palpably and geographically beneath the feet of the player in a way those later worlds cannot be. As an example, the character's hometown of Finn is within easy walking distance of Altair. Having one of the final areas next to the starting point is a flourish lifted directly from Dragon Quest, and it's even more maddening in Final Fantasy II because our goal is right there, frustratingly close yet just out of reach for our paltry power. So, we must circumnavigate the world, and all of those travels lead back to Altair. Like hubs in most games, Altair feels like a haven and is a reprieve from the violence, but unlike most, that feeling of safety wanes throughout the game. Final Fantasy II isn't a static world waiting around for the player to complete the requisite steps to topple Palamecia. It should be noted that Altair isn't a hub in the modern sense of the word. The hideaway in 16 is the only true hub zone in the Final Fantasy series, but Altair is a location that we keep returning to time and time again throughout the game, and it changes as the game goes along, not just from expanding when the times are good, but retracting and even getting destroyed when the times get really, really bad. Major hubs getting destroyed is something that just doesn't happen often. Even in a game like Bloodborne that has a repressive, cruel atmosphere, the hub in the hunter's dream remains, from beginning to end, a place of security. Altair doesn't provide such eternal comfort. Just like the Firelink Shrine bonfire getting extinguished in Dark Souls after the long trek back out of the decrepit waste of Lordran, the destruction of Altair is one of the great emotional lows in the series. It's not that this is the first stress placed on Altair. 
bad things and unfortunate circumstances have not been strangers in Altair. The Lamia Queen imitating Princess Hilda is an example, although if that were me personally, I'd have rizzed up the Lamia Queen unlike the do-nothing Firion. Slowly, the base of operations moves away from Altair as serious ground is gained against the Empire. But the destruction is different from these other minor ebbs. The city is wiped out. The people are dead and displaced. It's not just that the place of peace and tranquility that's protected the player has changed. It's that it's gone. Completely wiped off the map to the point that you can't even visit it anymore. You can only look at its rubble and ruins. It's a genuine loss. A backward slide after a moment of great triumph where the player defeats the Emperor of Palamecia. As the video game industry at large has become increasingly concerned with the attention economy and consistent small doses of dopamine, the destruction of Altair remains, to this day, a striking moment. A town that you've grown intimately familiar with is destroyed, and you couldn't save it. These types of changes happen in smaller doses all over the place in two, with sea and airports getting opened and closed, and the makeup of cities changing with the times. The world of two is a constantly changing place, and that can't be said of many other games in the series. The severity of changes to the world will increase in a game like 6, and the destruction of Altair will be reprised in 16, but for the most part, the overworlds in games like 1, 3, 4, 5, 9, 12, and so on expand linearly throughout the game, rarely retracting in the ways 2 does. Getting the canoe and boat and ultimately the airship feel like real victories. You're becoming more self-sufficient in a world that constantly puts you at its mercy, both in its narrative twists and turns and the gameplay tricks like all the trap rooms and the numerous dungeons. After all, this is a game that kills you in its first minute. Instead of merely opening up the new world, the new modes of travel feel like overcoming the world and as tactile achievements against the Empire that kills NPCs and firebombs towns and kidnaps rebel leaders to halt you in your tracks. Now, if there is one area where the world design of 2 is lacking, it's in the dungeons. In the first game, the dungeons were awful to be in, but it was organic. It was terrible because of the monsters and the fire that bubbled up from the crust of the earth. In 2, the dungeons are haphazardly frustrating. Every dungeon in the game features many empty rooms that have increased encounter rates and ultimately serve as time wasters. The unpleasant tedium of these empty rooms makes late game dungeons a drag, even when the story is reaching its crescendo. Late game dungeons like Mysidia Tower and Pandemonium are some of the most tedious locations in the series, especially on a first playthrough. As the size of the dungeons balloons, so too does the volume of empty rooms. Outside of 3, the Final Fantasy series rarely features superlative dungeons. Even the best games in the series, 6 and 7, don't have many memorable dungeons. It's just not a dungeon crawling series, but 2 specifically stands out for having the only consistently bad dungeons in the series. As much as I enjoyed Final Fantasy 2, and as much as my appreciation for it has increased while writing this video, I also can't lie. 2 is the one game in the series that I had to sit down and force myself to finish. The dungeons take that much of a toll on the experience. As with all things, this flaw is ironed out by a second playthrough and maps of the dungeons, but unlike most other questionable design decisions in the series, nothing of interest would be lost by chopping off the empty rooms. Yet, despite some decades-old caustic design choices, Final Fantasy II deserves great credit. It's the first game in the series to create dynamic personalities. Many of the characters are still rudimentary. Of the playable cast, most can be understood on simple terms. Firion is a nice guy, Maria is collected and caring, and Guy speaks beaver. The support cast provides much more depth, with characters like the thief Paul and the cowardly Gordon. Gordon's angst over his cowardice and his subsequent rise as a competent and brave person is a full story arc dedicated to a minor character, and it lights the way for characters like Edward and Hope who will follow a similar path. This even extends to the villains. Even though we live in a garland and chaos renaissance thanks to Strangers of Paradise, the villains in the first game were more intellectually stimulating than present characters with personality. The twist itself to tie Garland into Chaos is cool, but it's the bulk of what we know about Garland and Chaos. 
The Emperor of Palamecia is a more present villain, and is simultaneously more generic than Chaos, but also more interesting as an entity. Chaos is awesome, mostly by the sheer insanity of his plan. Launching oneself back in time to create an infinite time loop to gain eternal life and power is a true dedication to the craft. The Emperor, by contrast, is an evil dude being evil. He has his moments, like throwing the player to the lions for his amusement in the Colosseum, and that's awesome. Well, I say that's all the Emperor is, except when we kill him, his hate is so powerful that we have to go into the afterlife, chase after him into the bowels of hell, where he sits upon Satan's throne, and kill him again for good measure. That goes so unbelievably hard. It's an ending that corrupts the story of Orpheus into a form that somehow prefaces both Doom and Earthbound. Between Chaos and the Emperor, early Final Fantasy sets the stage for the long-running tradition of human villains ascending to twisted, corrupted god forms that must be slayed by the player. It's a trope that gets made fun of a lot, and in the case of Final Fantasy II, it's pretty goofy, but one of the consistent features of Final Fantasy is how well they utilize this trope. We won't be spending extensive time on each final boss in the series, but this trope is used with much more depth and nuance than the generic JRPG makes you kill God description makes it seem. When looking at the characters of Final Fantasy II, the icing here is Leon and his arc. By modern Final Fantasy standards, and by modern I mean like Final Fantasy IV, Leon's arc is simple. However, there are unique flourishes that give it life. Like the class selection menu at the start of the first game, the player is asked to name all four of the main characters at the outset of the journey. Being able to give custom names to the playable cast will remain a staple in the series, even into the voice acted 10, and it's a feature that's underappreciated by many critics and fans. Since 2 is the first game in the series to have playable characters with canonical names, the default answer by many is to leave the default names. I'm like this. Across the whole series, I changed exactly one character name. For most, and for myself, the default names are useful because they create a common vocabulary for talking about the games, and by using the canonical names, there's a sense, probably an incorrect sense, that you're getting the intended experience of the story. Yet the option to change names is there across most of the series, and it can't be written off. When the player changes the names of the characters, they take a partial authorship over the text, Video games already make players a collaborator in the process by placing them in the active role of playing, and the simple act of naming the character gives the player another layer of connection to the work. To take a digression to Mother 3, and minor Mother 3 spoilers ahead for about the next 30 seconds, director Shigesato Itoi spoke about reactions to Hinawa's death and how it was more impactful to players who gave Hinawa a personalized name, saying... It's a big deal to give your characters names of their own. When I heard about the impressions people got from Hinawa's death, the ones that really stood out to me were from people who named her after their own mothers. What stands out to me here is that Itoi refers to the characters as your characters, and emphasizes how the personalized names increase the emotional attachment a player feels to the character that they, in part, helped create. Naming Leon early gives him extra dramatic heft, and he stays in the player's head throughout the game. He's a part of the Finian foursome that initiates the player's journey, and it's impossible to feel whole until the gang of scrubs slaughtered in the opening are reunited and can overcome Palamecia once and for all. On a narrative level, Final Fantasy II is a major step for the series. And, despite its reputation as a black sheep, it's arguably the most formative of the early Final Fantasy games. The gameplay in 2 would mature into the Saga series, and that causes some people to underappreciate what 2 did for Final Fantasy. It's the advance guard for the series, conquering an unknown wilderness, laying a groundwork that Final Fantasy 3 would manipulate, and, in some ways, abandon in order to craft the best game of the NES trilogy.
of all the Final Fantasy games, 3 is probably the least popular outside of Japan, or it was the last one I got my hands on, which makes it the least popular. Maybe. It was never released outside of Japan until the Pixel remaster in 2021, other than a divisive 3D remake on the DS. I have some experience with that remake, and as anybody who's played it can understand, there's a reason I have some experience rather than extensive experience with the remake. 3 was even skipped over for release on the PlayStation, the Game Boy Advance, and PSP. It feels so intentionally hateful, especially because it was passed over in favor of Chrono Trigger on the PS1 compilation Final Fantasy Chronicles. There is an explanation that makes sense. Re-releases of Final Fantasy 1 and 2 are based on the Wonderswan color version of the game, and there's no Wonderswan color version of 3. There is, however, a Wonderswan color version of 4, and I'm sure there's an explanation, but no matter what it may be, it's just been a rough go of it for Final Fantasy 3. And, as if matters for this little game couldn't get any worse, the game that originally wore the Final Fantasy 3 moniker for US gamers was Final Fantasy VI, one of the most beloved games of all time. I bring up this game's long-suffering release history because of how important Final Fantasy III is. Not necessarily important for the series and its overall development, although it is, but for this video. I had, at one point or another, made an attempt at every mainline Final Fantasy game before embarking on this journey, but made significant progress in very few of them. Going into this video, 3 was the only game in the series that I'd never attempted in its original or original adjacent form. A few hours of the 3D remake was my only knowledge, and looking for an RPG to play on Steam Deck, I picked up the Pixel Remaster and got strangely, shockingly addicted. I beat Final Fantasy 3 over a summer weekend. Like I said at the top of the video, this was the spark for this entire journey. But it wasn't until I was knee-deep into Final Fantasy VIII that I knew I had to make a video about this franchise. I owe a lot of hard work, and sweat, and stress, and endless wheel spinning to Final Fantasy III. So, thanks. Because now I have to answer the question of why three? Why was it this underplayed game that hooked me into the series so deeply and profoundly when past attempts at six and seven and ten failed? The gameplay innovation of 3 is the new job system, a mechanic that allows players to swap characters between different classes on the fly. Unlike the rigidity of the class selection in the first game, the job system opens up player freedom and customization as the game progresses. Like 2, the characters are blank slates in terms of builds, if you can even say that they have builds. Anyone can do anything, but unlike 2, the job system gives players direct and obvious feedback through class and character levels that improve through standard experience points, while also restricting the characters to whatever weapon and magic types are associated with their chosen job. At the start, most of the jobs available to the player are standard Final Fantasy jobs, but as 3 progresses, the collection of available jobs becomes wider and more unique. Some jobs are straight upgrades, but many offer strange and bizarre utility. In this assortment of jobs, many Final Fantasy staples are either standardized or birthed. Black mages and white mages and monks and thieves are officially series staples, and the later standard bearers of dragoons, summoners, and bards start here. But there are also a lot of strange lads that are rarely iterated on. Geomancer is my favorite among them, but he'll be back in five. For the goobers trapped in three, the viking and scholar stand out. The Viking is an awesome, tanky, vengeful maniac, and the Scholar is a Poindexter book-reading nerd who's absolutely worthless. I wasn't expecting Final Fantasy III to be an extended Professor Bopper call-out, but here we are, and I feel very seen. As far as each class goes, and the specific nuances of what they do, or theoretically do in the Scholar's case, I won't meticulously describe them because part of the joy of Final Fantasy III is experimenting with each of them. However, this experimentation is also the weakest part of 3, or at least its biggest missed opportunity. As a game, it doesn't exactly encourage experimentation, at least across the entire spectrum of jobs, because some jobs are poorly implemented into the game because of how equipment is handled. Each job is locked to specific armor and weapon types, but not all armor and weapon types are readily available. Sometimes the gear for a job isn't accessible until well after the job itself is made available. This can give the impression that some jobs are bad before they even have a chance to do anything. 
It's a minor complaint in the totality of the game because there's also no punishment for experimentation. Unlike 1, there are no permanent decisions in 3, and while there is a meta, there aren't wrong answers. In the few instances that the game requires the player to use specific jobs such as dragoons to defeat Garuda or magical classes when you turn miniature in the Nepto Temple, the telegraphing is often blatant. 3 is not trying to trick anyone with its customization. Up to this point, I haven't made any reference to the narrative or the characters because this is the second and final single player game in the series without a named cast of playable characters. You play as a group of kids from a small town that are exploring a cave opened up by an earthquake and discover a light crystal that grants them power and presumptuously tasks them with saving the world. This simple call to action sets up 3 as a light, fun, adventurous romp. The party of kids are lovingly called the Onion Knights, and those Onion Knights, rustic and ordinary, save the world in Final Fantasy's most childlike story. If Final Fantasy has a Dragon Quest game, this is it. Some people may attach that honorific to 5, but that game's just a little too irresponsible. We'll get to that later. Even though the playable cast doesn't have the involved stories that the party in 2 had, there are still many memorable characters in the game. Some of them have the noble and melodramatic stories that populated too. Desh, for example, is an amnesiatic warrior, a classic that the Onion Knights aid, who nobly sacrifices himself, throwing himself down the Tower of Owen, reinforcing the tower against the forces of evil, while the Fellows, a group of old men who believe they are the heroes of light, offer a more comedic turn, embarrassingly flailing in their heroism, but still being helpful and kind-hearted enough to make it comedic pathos. And for Desh, he comes back at the end, heroic and powerful, because this is just the type of game that this is. While there is still an overarching narrative, much of the game is built around these fun, bizarre, or cool characters and vignettes that give the game a stronger adventure flavor than the previous games had. Although we're still not at the point in the series where expansive side content exists, this is the game that is most overtly built like a travelogue novel. This doesn't just apply to the numerous characters and freaks that populate the world. There are also various set pieces that stand out against the rest of the series. On top of all the strange and unique dungeons, you have places like Seronia. Seronia is a town under siege, and unlike the other towns up to this point in the series, it is divided up into different sections, and this expanded scope makes the siege larger. It's intimidating as a player to walk into a place being bombarded by airships and being cooed by its own massive military. Even more intimidating because the player gets shot out of the sky trying to infiltrate the city. Losing our ship, wonderfully named Enterprise, to anti-air fire is serious business, but it's not the first mishap we've endured with our poor ship. The most delightful part of this adventure, and why I think this game, more than any other in the series, hooked me and got me addicted, is how the scope and the adventure keeps expanding, and how much joy the game takes in unfurling its world. Part of that is a large number of vehicles that the game gives you. You receive a new airship four separate times. One can set sail on the seas, one can become a submarine, another is a huge fat fucker with a store inside and mountain traversal technology, and none of these acquisitions happen without loss. The game is constantly messing with your available tools, and part of that comes from how it opens up the world. The first tentative steps outside of the Onion Knight's hometown reveals the small world around them. And then once you destroy a boulder blocking the valley out of the Knight's homeland, by ramming it with an airship of course, a whole world opens up. But my favorite gameplay moment, not just in this game, but in the entire series, is when the Knights get their second airship temporarily for good. I was flying around and needing to cross back to the other side of the map, I went off the map, thinking it would loop me back around only to see a loading screen, and the airship appear not on the other side of the map, but on a new, larger overworld that revealed that the Knight's home continent, which I assume to be the whole explorable world, is a dot on a great sea. In games like 5 and 6, there will be an emphasis on recontextualizing the overworld, but the ever-expanding map in 3 is my favorite example of playing with the overworld in the series because of how fun it is to find new places the Onion Knights had probably never imagined, and how fun it is finding all the new tools to explore the world. Besides, someone needs to explore the world. After all, there's a bad dude named Zand who's working on an evil plot to destroy the world. 
To kill this big, dumb idiot is going to take a lot of firepower from our Onion Knights, and outfitting them with the equipment they need is paramount, and it is the toughest challenge in the game. As the game approaches its final hours, the gimmicks that define the dungeons of Final Fantasy III fade away in favor of unrelenting, hardcore difficulty. When the player walks into the Crystal Tower, they are presented with the choice to go up and beat the game, or go down and not beat the game. Going down takes the player to Eureka, a brutal dungeon that bestows unto the player the game's ultimate weapons. Secret super weapons tied to side quests existed as early as the Excalibur in the first game, and the Blood Sword is pretty ultimate in 2, but it's here in 3 that ultimate weapons begin to take the form that will define them for the rest of the series. When we look forward to games like 9 and 10, each ultimate weapon will have its own dedicated side quest. Those side quests are also almost always bad or tedious, sometimes in more profound ways than 3's method of stuffing all the weapons in a single toxic gauntlet. Like the rest of the gameplay in 3, tying ultimate weapons to optional dungeons will be reiterated upon and improved in 5, but Eureka deserves praise as the first piece of optional, soul-sucking, difficult side content in the series. Final Fantasy isn't a difficult series, but many of the games do feature difficult challenges in the form of optional dungeons and super bosses. The first super boss will appear in 5, with 3 preluding that with the Super Dungeon. Eureka is packed with horrific enemies and bosses, and it almost stopped this video before it even existed as a concept. After plowing through the game with little resistance, Eureka made me drop the game briefly for a few days to reset and reflect. I came back, still got my ass kicked, but it was more satisfying the second time around. The generous changes that the Pixel Remaster makes to saving reduces the grind. For most of the game, and for most of the first six games that have been Pixel Remastered, the ability to save anywhere, and autosaves being generated every time the player traverses a door, is a quality of life feature that minimally changes the experience. In most circumstances, Final Fantasy is a series generous with save points but the Famicom trilogy is still a product of its time. Final Fantasy III is particularly nasty. Its final dungeons are all long and difficult with no save points. The grueling, crushing grinds of Eureka, the Crystal Tower, and the World of Darkness are a defining feature of Final Fantasy III for anyone strong enough to best them, but the experience has been radically changed by the Pixel Remaster's forgiving save system. My frustration at Eureka, dropping the game briefly because I'd get killed a couple of times by a Guardian or a Shyla or a General because the tanky crazed enemies have drained my resources is cute. For those who've beaten the Famicom version of 3 or the DS remake, it's downright adorable to see a Pixel Remaster player give up. I just had no idea. For Final Fantasy 2 through 6, the Pixel Remasters are the only way I've beaten them. I fell in love with the series through the Pixel Remasters, so I'm a big believer in their value, but the endgame of Final Fantasy III being so radically changed from a gauntlet to a series of small, isolated challenges is a fundamental rift between the Pixel Remaster and the original version. Because of how much tinkering has happened to various re-releases of the first six games, it can be difficult to find a common language to discuss them. I briefly mentioned that when we talked about 1, but it's a consistent issue that flows through the series from 1 all the way to 12. Each version is just different enough to where the preoccupations of a player's joy and ire will be different, and for the superfans, they will spend decades arguing the merits of each version, proselytizing the supremacy of the Game Boy Advance versions. Well, not for three. But don't let these Mickey Mouse versions of the final dungeons take away the reward for beating Eureka, the strongest weapons in the game, and the right to purchase powerful spells. Even at the ends of the earth, the tools to save life itself are monetized. With the Eureka weapons in tow, it's time to duel the Dark Magician Zand, and whoops, he's not the real final boss. That title belongs to Zand's puppet master, the Cloud of Darkness. Seeing the gigantic naked green miasma that is Cloud of Darkness, perfectly framed for visibility and size, gave me pause. This is a first for the series, having a true evil entity behind the nominal antagonist. In 1 and 2, the supercharged godlike final bosses are versions of the main antagonists. After a whole game spent hunting Zand, the sudden reveal of a more powerful, more duplicitous force behind the madness engages the series with the ancient idea that the source of evil and suffering is something more primordial, 
more indescribable than mere man. In Beowulf, after the titular epic hero destroys the monstrous Grendel, a more terrible fiend emerges, Grendel's mother. She moved still faster, took a single victim from, and fled from the hall, running to the moors, discovered, but her supper assured, sheltered in her dripping claws. She take Hrothgar's closest friend, the man he most loved of all men on earth. She killed a glorious soldier, cut a noble life short. No geat could have stopped her. The arrival of a more terrible force beyond the antagonist is a narrative device that can be frustrating for some audiences. That Zand is built up over the course of the game to be swept aside by the cloud of darkness by Grendel's mother seems to throw away hours of dramatic buildup, but that's only one way to look at it. If Final Fantasy III ends with Zand, the game would work perfectly well. But Final Fantasy, like most classic fantasy, is steeped in the narrative traditions of epic poetry. For the Onion Knights to be true epic heroes, they must destroy Zand and also the wellspring from which he poured. Some will argue that Zand himself is undone by the existence of Cloud of Darkness and it takes away Zand's agency as an evildoer. Agency is important for characters in some narrative traditions. The traditions of Shakespeare and the Romantics in particular emphasize agency, but it's not the only tradition. Returning to Beowulf, Grendel, a villain supplanted like Zand, was conceived by a pair of those monsters born of Cain, murderous creatures banished by God, punished forever for the crime of Abel's death. The Almighty drove those demons out, and their exile was bitter. Shut away from men, they split into a thousand forms of evil. Spirits and fiends, goblins, monsters, giants, a brood forever opposing the Lord's will. Grendel was doomed by apocryphal sin to cruelty and evil. He has no say in the matter and is a puppet in the cosmic war between evil and righteousness. Functionally, the difference between figures like Grendel and Zane is that Grendel is described as a monster of Cain as a part of his introduction, while Zand isn't revealed to be a puppet until deep into Three's story. The difference is really only a matter of bookkeeping. Zan's agency, or lack thereof, does very little for the narrative itself. Character agency matters only so far as their inner monologue makes it matter. There will be characters later in the series, like Celis, Titus, and Clive, that are modeled after the romantic hero, who struggle with limitations of agency and free will, but that's not the tradition Zand is a part of. He is the middle management in the hall of mythological villains that our epic heroes need to overcome to balance the world. Early Final Fantasy, especially 1 and 3, is steeped in mythological storytelling. This will change. The next game in the series, Final Fantasy 4, will move away from the faded epics of antiquity and embrace the romantic turmoil of the soul.